Um, welkom. Uh, welkom to Amsterdam, hè, zeggen we dan. Um, samen uh, met Bart, ik ga even zitten, het is wat intiemer, het is echt hoog. Ik hoorde dat net ook al van Jacco, het is heel hoog en dan kijk ik neer op jullie. Um, samen met uh, Bas Beekman, die hier in de zaal zit, geef ik een jaar al leiding aan wat we hebben genoemd Startup Amsterdam. En dat is een programma om Amsterdam vast te krijgen in de top drie van Europa als start-up en tech-ecosysteem. Uh, en het grappige is, waar we ook komen, zien de hele tijd bekende gezichten. En wat we dan zeggen, het is een kleine wereld en uh, laten we die laten groeien. Dus welkom weer allemaal. En uh, ja, wat zo gaaf is dat we uh, met elkaar start-up Amsterdam zijn en allerlei dingen doen. Uh, en vandaag hebben we, uh, wat mij betreft, iets bijzonders op het programma, want... Startup Amsterdam van nature helpt andere spelers, zoals Accelerator-programma's en investeerders en universiteiten, om nou ja, hun dingen beter te doen, uh, sneller te doen. Um, maar nu hebben we een keer zelf wat georganiseerd, dat is namelijk Jacco. Um, en Jacco gaat een verhaal vertellen over verkoop, het nieuwe verkopen. En uh, we vonden dat dat verhaal hier in Nederland uh, gehoord moet uh, worden. Ik zal daar zo meteen nog wat, uh, wat meer over vertellen. Uh, maar voordat we Jacco aan het woord hebben, uh, wil ik graag beginnen met uh, Anja, Anja Westboer. Um, want waar we ook zijn, ook Startup Amsterdam moet zichzelf verkopen. Ja, daar gaat het om uiteindelijk een start die pitcht en dan uh, heeft hij uiteindelijk een aas. Dat kan geld zijn of een launching customer zijn. Ja, ik zie hier al wat uh, glimlachen van, van start-ups en, en scale-ups in de zaal. En dat hebben wij ook als programma. En waarom? Omdat... Onze rol is uiteindelijk om uh, corporate partners te betrekken bij het start-up ecosysteem. Um, en die uh, door te zetten naar die accelerator programma's, die door te zetten naar investeerders, naar start-ups als launching customer. Um, en Anja is daar uh, nou ja, dag en nacht mee bezig. Um, dus Anja, als je ons daar wat over wil vertellen. Um, en aan de corporates de uitnodiging om goed te luisteren en mee te gaan doen. Uh, en dat kan heel klein uh, en dat kan dan vervolgens uitgroeien. En, aan het eind van de dag, daar hebben de start-ups wat aan, want daarmee groeien ze sneller uiteindelijk de wereld in. Anja, aan jou. Ja, dankjewel. Eigenlijk hebben we alles al verteld, dus dat is mooi. <laughs> uh, maar het Corpus Partners Programma, Corpus Partners Program, I don't know, English, Dutch, Nederlands, is prima. Oké, okay, doen we dat. Um, wat doe ik dan als uh, Corpus Partner Manager? Ik ben eigenlijk alleen maar bezig, zoals Ruben zegt, met connecten. Dus dingen die in de start-up wereld gebeuren, behoeftes die we zien, die we horen van start-ups, die probeer ik te connecten aan corporates. Maar ook uh, corporates hebben uh, dingen die ze nodig hebben. Uh, er gebeurt ook heel veel op dat uh, uh, vlak in die wereld. En ik probeer eigenlijk ze allebei bij elkaar te brengen uh, via ons uh, programma. Uh, ik heb een paar voorbeelden voorbereid, daar loop ik even naartoe. Um, het Founders Network, uh, twee ondernemers met een visie. Hey, als founders, start-up founders moeten wij vaker bij elkaar komen. Moeten wij uh, kennis delen, ervaringen delen. En uh, om dat uh, ja, nog een boost te geven, willen wij graag uh, captains of the industry daarbij hebben. Om uh, inzichten te krijgen en ook hun een beetje weer uh, te inspireren. En um, dat waren twee ondernemers die dat willen starten, Founders Network. Wij hebben ze nu gekoppeld aan de Rabobank. En uiteindelijk is uh, Rabobank nu de founding partner geworden. Dus op die manier uh, connecties gemaakt. Een ander voorbeeld, dankjewel. Uh, Oracle, Erik Visser is ook hier in de zaal vandaag. Um, die wilde meer gaan doen met start-ups. Nou ja, wat kan je dan doen? Uh, hoe kan je samen innoveren? bepaalde visie bij, maar dan moet je nog bij de start-ups komen. Dus hebben ze meegedaan met de launch met meetups vorig jaar in december. En uh, nou ja, dan krijgen we een paar weken later het mooie nieuws dat er in samenwerking met uh, 904 Labs uit is gekomen. En dat ze dus een mooie uh, driehoek kunnen gaan werken tussen de technologie van Oracle, de klant en uh, 904 Labs als innovatief element erbij. Um, het laatste voorbeeld wat ik wil geven is de Amsterdam Capital Week. Waarin wij vorig jaar... Jacco, wil je nog een keer klikken? Dankjewel. Waarin wij vorig jaar bij de eerste editie al duizend start-ups uh, met 500 investoren konden uh, verbinden. 
En dat bij 30 events. Nou ja, dit jaar gaan we weer uh, de Capital Week organiseren. En zoeken wij ook weer voor alle events corporate partners. Dus daar win ik dan weer in beeld. Uh, mocht u de corporates in de zaal denken van, nou ik wil wel een event sponsoren. Laat het mij graag weten. En uh, start-ups met je aan natuurlijk. En dan uh, de laatste slide. Jacco, weer nog een keer klikken, dankjewel. Um, ambitie is eigenlijk om het grootste uh, launchpad network in Europa te bouwen. Zodat start-ups hier uh, in Amsterdam echt uh, snel kunnen starten in Nederland, maar ook door kunnen groeien in Europa en de wereld. En dat uh, corporates makkelijk in contact kunnen komen met start-ups en de innovatie die zij brengen. En um, daardoor ook weer kunnen profiteren van een goede omgeving met talent, uh, investment en innovatie. Dus uh, straks bij de borrel zou ik zeggen, kom, vind me en dan ga ik jullie allemaal verbinden. Dankjewel. En... Um... We dachten, we hebben een voorprogramma nodig voor Jacco. Zo gaat dat. Want je bent een beetje een artiest, ook vandaar dit podium. Overigens hoe dat dan gaat, we proberen als Startup Amsterdam al die plekken in de stad te bezoeken en te verbinden aan het Startup Ecosysteem. Zo kwamen we hier bij het Tropenmuseum. Ik was nog nooit in deze zaal geweest. Ik weet niet hoe dat voor jullie is. Maar we kwamen hier binnen en zeiden, nou, hier moeten we gewoon een gaaf event doen. En dan is 1 plus 1 is 2. En ik denk dat dat... Um, um, is wat het start-up ecosysteem in Amsterdam zo groot maakt. We hebben uh, 9 maart hebben we in Boom Chicago een event, Boom Startup. Uh, en dan gaan we onszelf wat minder serieus nemen. Zometeen gaat Jacco serieus in op uh, hoe je je salesorganisatie op een nieuwe manier kan, uh, kan opbouwen. Maar 9 maart uh, hebben we 330 man in de zaal uh, en dan gaan we onder andere ook om onszelf lachen. We zoeken overigens nog één start-up die geroast wil worden uh, op die 9 maart. Um, vandaar dat we hier zijn beland. Um, en dat voorprogramma, um, daarvoor heb ik gevraagd André Knol van InnoLeaps. Want André is dag en nacht bezig met zal maar zeggen, de verbinding tussen start-ups en corporates. En uh, ik denk een week of drie, vier geleden zaten we um, in een, uh, dat was bij het Lloyd Hotel. En ik stelde aan André de vraag, deel nou eens jouw visie op hoe corporates... Um, een, 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 op een betere manier, op een scherpere manier onderdeel kunnen zijn van het tech-ecosysteem. Uh, en ik heb hem gevraagd vandaag om uh, dat te delen, die visie te delen en dan in een miniatuurversie, want ik weet dat kan zomaar uh, een uur of twee duren, maar um, ik zei van, goh, heb je dan een zin om je te introduceren? En de volgende zin heb je gegeven. Veel corporates zitten in een slow motion crash. Um, en wij uh, als InnoLeaps willen ze um, speed en ability geven. Um, snelheid en bekwaamheid. Um, aan jou André om uh, het voorprogramma te zijn en uh, te delen hoe je dat ziet. Dank je wel. Zo, ja heel goed. Um, hartelijk dank uh, voor, de, voor de uitnodiging. Uh, fijn om hier, uh, om hier te staan. Um, ja, ik kom daar zo nog even op terug op die slow motion crash. Uh, nou, dit zijn wij, dit kun je ook op de internetsite vinden, vind ik niet spannend. We zijn met een heleboel mensen, we doen voor een heleboel klanten doen we wat. Maar ik heb weinig tijd, dus ik wil daar uh, eigenlijk meteen naar de inhoud. Uh, what's going on here? Uh, jullie zullen deze twee broers uh, goed kennen, denk ik, niet persoonlijk. Uh, die zijn ook ooit in een garage begonnen. Uh, we werden ook niet serieus genomen, want ja, ach, no passengers, no freight. Dus a few years later kwamen die grote vliegtuigen over hen heen. En dit is natuurlijk een vrij uitgekoud uh, voorbeeld, maar innovatie is een continu proces. Dit is hetzelfde vliegtuig, misschien een ander uh, toestel, uh, maar het vliegen is nog steeds hetzelfde. Alleen hier is het businessmodel juist wat veranderd wordt. En zo is continu disruptie aan de gang. En zeker hier, zeker nu, want de technologie, eigenlijk de technologische democratisering die nu gaande is... Dat is de komende vier, vijf jaar bereikt het zijn, uh, uh, weer een soort nieuw plateau. Waarbij er heel veel zeg maar, industrieën uh, op die wijze op zijn kop worden gezet. Omdat eigenlijk alle technologie voorhanden is om, uh, om aan de onderkant uh, bedrijven uh, aan te vallen. Het zijn niet alleen start-ups die dat doen, uh, uh, die bepaalde industrieën aanvallen. Maar het zijn ook de pure players, Apple, Google en dergelijke, die juist van de bovenkant weer uh, aanvallen. Um, en er zijn heel wat voorbeelden van. Hè. Door, juist door deze, door deze technologische doorbraken zie je dat er eigenlijk hele nieuwe regels gaan ontstaan. 
Uh, dat er uh, uh, helemaal geen content nodig is om wel een, een absolute beste partij te zijn op het gebied van, uh, van content. En zo zijn er heel wat meer uh, voorbeelden die, uh, die je kunt uh, voorstellen. Even wat gebeurt er eigenlijk? Als je kijkt, ik begreep dat Rabak in de zaal is, dus ik heb dit voorbeeld erbij gepakt. Uh, dan zie je dat zo'n propositie die vanuit een corporate wordt, uh, wordt neergezet, dat die ontbundeld wordt. Uh, door allerlei kleine partijen die specifiek ergens op inzoomen en daar met een hele andere propositie de aanval inzetten. En dat gebeurt bij de Rabobank, bij zakelijk ook, dat gebeurt ook bij delivery services, dat gebeurt ook bij, wat hebben we nog meer, home control en zo kun je wel doorgaan. Maar waar het eigenlijk om gaat is het, het volgende wat mij betreft en dat is eigenlijk dat niet zozeer de turbulentie is het gevaar wat hier in schuil gaat, maar het is juist de wijze waarop je daarmee omgaat. Uh, als je uitgaat dat je op dezelfde manier handelt als dat je voorheen hebt gehandeld, dan kun je niet met deze snelheid omgaan. En dan kom ik op die slow motion crash. Want je denkt dat je een slow motion crash zit van drie, vier, vijf jaar, omdat je zoveel tijd is gegeven, gezien de technologische ontwikkelingen. Uh, dan denk je, nou, vier, vijf jaar, dat is al best veel tijd. Alleen je hebt één, twee, drie, vier, vijf keer om te corrigeren. Want de correctie bij een groot bedrijf die zo geconditioneerd is, die is vaak, duurt kost, kost vaak een jaar. Um, en dat dilemma heb ik proberen weer te geven in een schema. Uh, dat zie je hier op, het, uh, op deze slide. En dit is als het ware de, ja, de, de bestaande business die aan het interen is. Van conventionele producten. En de meeste bedrijven kun je zo ongeveer daar neerzetten. Ik ben zo vrij geweest om ze daar te plaatsen. En wat je doet als bedrijf is vervolgens ga je rationaliseren. Je gaat saneren, je gaat marketingacties doen, je gaat van alles doen om eigenlijk die interende lijn tegen te gaan. En daar ben je heel goed in geworden de laatste jaren. Je bent heel optimaal en, en, en efficiënt. Uh, alleen tegelijkertijd zie je dat je ook wil innoveren. Alleen het vreselijke dilemma aan innovatie is, is dat de omzet beperkt en onzeker is. En het zorgt voor een enorm dilemma bij een bestuurder of bij een middelmanager om daarmee om te gaan. Want als ik zo geconditioneerd ben om heel erg goed te zijn in rationaliseren, sterker nog, ik word erop afgerekend. Ik word ervoor betaald om op deze wijze met mijn business om te gaan. En de omzet van innovatie is beperkt en onzeker. Dan krijg ik eigenlijk geen besluitvorming voor elkaar. Want ik kan tot twee cijfers achter de comma kan ik uitrekenen welke interventies ik moet doen om uiteindelijk die interende lijn tegen te gaan. Vooralsnog tenminste. En bij innovatie is het onzeker. En dat zorgt ervoor dat de meeste innovatie als het ware halverwege alweer gekild wordt. Omdat het niet volgens de juiste KPIs zeg maar... Uh, 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 wordt, uh, uh, wordt ondersteund of er is geen draagvlak voor en dergelijke. Terwijl je met dat dilemma bezig bent als bestuurder, zie je dat nieuwe toetreders uh, met emerging technologies uh, heel snel opkomen. En het interessante is overigens dat er een, uh, een verschil is tussen het een en het ander. Je wil eigenlijk zelf die golf ook pakken. Um, en er is een verschil tussen waar de grote bedrijven hier staan en waar de kleine start-ups daar nog staan. Even afgezien nog van nieuwe toetreders vanuit Google, Apple, of, of wie dan ook die volgens mij daar bovenaan ergens staan en denken, hé, hey, wacht even, die health tech, dat is interessant, zitten goede marges in. Laat ik daar eens uh, induiken met mijn kritieke massa als Google of Apple. Um, wat hier mooi aan is, want het lijkt alsof ik een heel zwartgallig verhaal uh, opsteek, maar de corporates die hebben een heel veel vermogen, heel veel waarde. En dat is niet alleen financiële vermogen, maar ook toegang, uh, contacten en contracten met klanten en kanalen en dergelijke. Dus op het moment dat start-ups en corporates gaan samenwerken, en je realiseert je waar een ieder goed in is, dan kun je elkaar daarin gebruiken om samen deze innovatie te maken. Een start-up heeft snelheid, een corporate heeft diepe zakken, het vermogen om te kunnen schalen. Uh, Even om in te gaan wat er eigenlijk normaal gesproken gebeurt als ik met dit dilemma kamp als, als grote corporate. Is ik heb dan, ik ga zeg maar het normale uh, riedeltje af van strategiebepaling en, en change management. Ik heb een huidige situatie, ik heb een toekomstige situatie, ik heb een strategie en de realisatie ervan is iets weer barstiger, maar ik kom er wel, hè? drie tot vijf jaar. Alleen dit werkt niet meer tegenwoordig. Want wat er gebeurt is er zijn zoveel, uh, het doel waar jij naartoe wil, dat is een moving target. Dat is niet meer één doel waarbij ik over vijf jaar kan zeggen, nou daar moet ik heen, zo moet ik komen. Dat werkt niet meer zo. En op het moment dat het een moving target is, dan functioneert dit dus ook niet meer. Want dat kan wel eens zo zijn dat daar waar jij over het vijf jaar wil komen, dat dat gebied waar jij zit, dat dat er niet meer is. Of dat het niet meer relevant is, of dat er geen mensen meer zijn die daarvoor willen betalen. En wat wij hebben gemerkt op het moment dat je lean start-up, want dat is wat wij vaak toepassen, koppelt aan een corporate, zonder dat je weet wat je er precies mee kan of moet, 
Uh, dan zie je dat eigenlijk die waterval die ik net beschreef, die rechte lijn, dat, zo gaan we het doen, mooi in silo's en heel super efficiënt, dat die eigenlijk niet meer goed functioneert op het moment dat je daar Lean Startup op toepast. Want de meeste bedrijven, die willen dan Lean Startup, iteraties willen ze toepassen, terwijl je nog steeds precies die rechte lijn volgt. En dan kom je er dus ook niet, want het kan wel eens zijn dat je daar dus helemaal niet terecht wil komen. Uh, wat ook gebeurt, dat heb ik ook veel gezien, is uh, we hebben een lege vloer, uh, we halen tien start-ups in huis en we gaan uh, ze gewoon lekker laten, laten beginnen bij ons. Zonder enige visie of doel of wat dan ook. En dan zie je ook dat het vaak niet slaagt. En ik wil niet zeggen dat er geen visie of doel is, maar je hebt eigenlijk te weinig grip op het proces waardoor jij eruit haalt wat er ook echt in zou kunnen zitten. En daar is... Uh, zonder scope raak je ook echt helemaal de weg kwijt. Dat hebben wij veel ook gezien bij, uh, nou, tot een jaar terug, dat wij dat zelf ook mee bezig waren. Want we waren zelf ook aan het testen van hey, hoe, hoe functioneert dit nou? En dan kan het zijn dat je, wanneer je bij wijze van spreken in een corporate accelerator zit, dus een, bedrijf, een traject waarbij je in drie maanden heel erg hard gaat in plaats van in een anderhalf jaar, Um, dat je eigenlijk de eerste paar weken echt zo aan het zoeken bent, omdat je nog weinig scope hebt. En eigenlijk wat je wil, is je wil met die scope die je hebt, en met een duidelijke visie, daarbinnen wil je blijven. En daar wil je kijken, hey, hoe kan ik daarin de weg vinden naar mijn doel? Of dat nou het doel wat daar staat, of dat nou daar staat, of ik maak echt een koerswijziging, een strategische koerswijziging als bedrijf, dat ik zeg, hey, ik moet, ik moet ergens anders heen. Um, Als ik even inzoom op de huidige situatie van een meeste bedrijven, dan kan ik eigenlijk een soort indeling maken van hoe de meeste bedrijven er ongeveer uitzien. In ieder geval volgens dit kapstokje. Um, en de meeste bedrijven zijn heel erg goed, gewe goed geweest uh, uh, in inside en in control en efficiënt. Want je bent heel erg efficiënt geworden omdat je moest kosten uh, moest saneren of je moest allerlei andere dingen doen. Terwijl je nu juist, de markt vraagt erom... Uh, dat je veel meer flexibel wordt en creatief en effectief. En dat is een heel moeilijk, moeilijk dilemma voor, een, voor de meeste bedrijven, want die zijn heel erg goed geworden en efficiënt. Alleen als efficiënt je niet meer brengt daar je waar je moet zijn, dan moet je niet meer efficiënt zijn, maar moet je effectief zijn. En zo zie je ook dat de meeste dingen die de meeste bedrijven moeten als het ware wake up. In plaats van cool down moet ik naar nou wake up toe. En wat je dan ziet is de ene kamp zegt tegen de andere kamp, ja, maar wij als efficiënte jongens, wij vinden dat creatieve wel heel erg amateuristisch. Een MVP, dat kan toch niet? Hè? Wat je doet als ik heel snel wil gaan en wat die start-ups doen, dat is toch lang niet zo goed of mooi als wat wij uh, maken. Maar die start-ups die zijn met een heel ander doel, zijn zij die experimenten aan het runnen. Die zijn namelijk de meest riskante aannames zijn ze aan het valideren. En niet zozeer het mooiste product aan het maken. En daar zit een wezenlijk verschil. Ik kom er zo nog op terug. Uh, ik ga hier eventjes doorheen. Ja, kijk. Dit kenmerkt zich, deze kant kenmerkt zich door businessplannen en door waterfallplanning. En de andere kant kenmerkt zich meer door, uh, door agility, door uh, design thinking, door allerlei lean startup uh, tools die er zijn. Growth hacking, ga zo maar door. Eigenlijk alle tools die de startups ook gebruiken. En wat wij doen met de meeste grote bedrijven is, we hebben dus een groot bedrijf. Daar halen we teams uit en die laten we versnellen. Maar die komen later weer terug in de organisatie. Dat is een uh, moeilijk ding. Daar kom ik zo nog even op terug. Maar ik weet niet of mijn tijd, uh, de tijd mij gegunnet is. Wat zeg je? Oh, dat komt goed. Oké, okay, eventjes. Je hebt twee assen in mijn beleving. Je hebt de organisatieas en je hebt de businessas. De businessas is daar zit waar, het, waar het geld zit. Daar zit waar de omzet is en daar zit waar de klant. Um, en de organisatieas is de as waar... Um, de mensen zitten, waar de governance zit. En eigenlijk zoals wij kijken naar transformatie van een groot bedrijf, bedrijf is op deze wijze. Je bent, oh, je bent, uh, oh, gaat het goed? Nou, volgens mij heb ik er eentje geskipt, maakt niet uit. Als bedrijf sta je hier en ik wil daar naartoe. En dat kan ik doen via de business as en dat is een accelerator. Dat is vooral nieuw business creëren. Maar als jij met een accelerator bent, bezig bent, dan moet je ook um, uh, je organisatie mee veranderen. En dat is wat wij bijvoorbeeld doen met, uh, met masterclasses en met executive board sessies. En zo ben je eigenlijk met een organisch proces bezig van zowel aan de organisatie als aan de business werken om daarmee de verandering te, te, te halen die, uh, die je wil maken als bedrijf. Hoe doen uh, corporates dat? De meeste corporates 
zit er nog op, deze, op dit cursus Ik heb ideeën, ik ga execute en ik ga schalen. Zo hard mogelijk. Alleen op het moment dat ik heel veel onzekerheid heb, dan wil ik niet executen. Dan wil ik eerst zoeken. En dat is wat je met Lean Startup doet. In plaats van direct een waterval doen, heel efficiënt, moet je veel meer eens kijken, hey, is dit effectief? Dus vandaar dat je in dat proces een, een, een accelerator voor corporates kunt plaatsen. Search, validate en zo uh, uiteindelijk je doel uh, vinden. Geen businessplannen dus. Businessplannen zijn superbelangrijk, maar niet in deze fase. Dat kost te veel tijd. <coughs> en dat zorgt er ook voor dat je eigenlijk heel moeilijk is. Hoeveel tijd moet je er nou in stoppen zonder dat je weet dat je op het juiste pad bent. En eigenlijk moet je daarmee veel meer sneller gaan itereren dan dat je maanden bezig bent met het schrijven van een businessplan. General Electric is daarin een mooi voorbeeld, maar zo zijn er heel veel bedrijven die uh, nu Lean Startup toepassen, eigenlijk dezelfde startup methodologie toepassen als, uh, uh, als de startups dat zelf doen. Um, dit plaatje heb ik erbij gepakt, omdat het, 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 de zin hieronder vind ik het meest belangrijk. The biggest waste is launching a product customers don't want. De meeste bedrijven, zoals ik al zei, zijn heel goed in het uh, lanceren van producten. Alleen vaak is de behoefte er, uh, er net niet meer. Zit ik er net naast. Um, en de, eigenlijk de enige manier om te winnen uh, is om sneller te itereren dan je competitie. En dat is het allerbelangrijkste wat ik je zou willen meegeven. Als, als groot bedrijf moet je vooral inzetten op snelheid. En hoe organiseer je de innovatie om deze snelheid aan te kunnen? Ik... Uh, Dank jullie voor de tijd. Dankjewel. Dat waren 15 slides in een paar minuten. Um, de, de verbinding 1. Je kunt een mooie product market fit hebben, maar dan gaat het vervolgens om het verkopen. En daarom hebben Jacco gevraagd om uit te leggen uh, hoe ziet een moderne verkooporganisatie eruit. En het uh, interessante is, dit is volgens mij ongelooflijk relevant voor start-ups voor scale-ups en voor corporates. En niet alleen corporates aan de new product development kant, maar ook in hun bestaande business. Jacco, uh, uh, aan jou nu het podium, mag ik een, uh, een applaus voor Jacco. Hallo. Yes. How are you guys doing? My gosh. First of all, it's a pleasure and a treat for me to be here. I see some of my old friends. Thank you guys for coming all the way over. Thank you. Wow. Okay, here's what I'm going to do today. I'm looking to share with you my experience that I've gained. Now, where have I gained this experience from? So, since 98, when I left the Netherlands, I went and worked for startups. If you folks thought that you're going to learn today the way on how I'm going to describe to you how to be the next Facebook, fuck it, it's not going to happen. And if you do, because of this presentation, Please let me know, I would be great. I'd gladly take a profit of that piece, please. Thank you. But in the end, the story of startups is not about winning. Most of the stories of startups that we learn are like hundreds of smaller stories, smaller companies where we're really seeing it happen. As some of you go on trips to the US, most often you drive from Cisco to Apple, to Google, to Facebook, and so on. And if you think you can learn something from that, you're mistaken. It's not where success is happening. If you really look and analyze from early on what is behind that scene, there is a deep integrated infrastructure that boosts these companies to success. It is not just because Zuckerberg had a great idea. There are some really powerful people behind it that are pushing and shoving that in the right direction and making that happen. Now, so what I'm going to talk to you about is like what is really going on behind the scenes, the true understanding of what a startup is and where it comes from, as I've seen it. Now let me explain to you, I'm not going to try to you today show you this new methodology of selling. I'm not going to try to convince you. It's not, you know, trying to do that to a Dutch person is about committing suicide, right? I'm going to try to tell you something I want you to believe in it. It's not going to happen. All I want you to do is consider this as an option. All I'm going to do is open up your eyes and see how things are going. And if you take away a few IDs, then that is considered a success for me. Is that fair enough? Okay, ah. So, what we see down here, um, as I was fortunate enough to be invited to Harvard Business School, I was sitting in a class from Frank Cespedes. Frank Cespedes is the executive dean, whatever, somebody very important that, that teaches MBA programs. 
And what he did with this MBA program, he, he brought in a bunch of CEOs in a room like this, and they were asked, you know, like, if I have two axes, volume and profit, where do we want to be in this quadrant? Where would you go, sir, where would you think we want to be? Right up a corner, absolutely, money making, lots of it and lots of money and lots of deals. That's where we want to be. High volume, high profit, that's great. Where do you not want to be? Bottom left, which is the logical answer, which is what most of the rooms answer. Bottom left, it's the wrong thing. But it's the bottom left, and I set you up. Apologize, thank you, I need you cued it. And so the bottom left, so the entire classroom said, oh, we're gonna go to bottom left. And so Frank asked me, and Jocko, where, where do you not want, you know, where do you think the problem is? Or I actually didn't ask me, but he asked someone else. And they said, the bottom right. The bottom right is really the challenge for most businesses. Low profit, high volume. These are those companies that are on the downward uh, of the bell curve. They have lots of uh, volume and they have very little product, uh, profit. Now, the problem with those businesses are, if you suddenly lose a feature or something happens, then you're dropping into loss and now you're making a shitload of loss. By the way, I drop a lot of F-bombs and S-words and I do that primarily to imprint on your brain. Is there anybody who can stand that? Raise your hand and I'll, I'll tune it down accordingly. <laughs> Fuck it, we're going for it. <laughs> so, what the challenge is, if we understand this simple two by two, if we get to understand what happens here, you understand startups. Here's what startups do. Traditionally, conventional business says, grow it, up in volume, a little bit up in profit. Up in volume, up in profit. And we go slowly upright, 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 and we reach that, that little, little gap there where we have the eternal. The wisdom, the beautiful, the money, we're in a money-making zone. The problem is, traditional conventional companies, this takes 40, 50 years. It takes a long time, at least 10 years, but 40 to 50 years it takes to, to reach that upper part in the right kind. That's not how startups do it. And we're going to come back in a second on what a startup definition really is, because I, I want to clarify a couple of terms on that. So, startups go this way. They say, fuck it, I have no problem making a loss, and I'm going to make a lot of loss at it. But what I want to do is I want to gain velocity, speed. Speed is the entire name of the game. Faster, faster, faster. And they are willing to fund a loss, a big loss. Why? Because VCs can burn that money out of their pockets. But only if you have velocity. Only if we can get there pretty fast. Because if we're not, then we're toast. So every now and then, you hear VP of sales was let go at a company that had 380% growth. 380%, why did the VP of sales get lost? Uh, get, lost his job? Well, they were expecting 800% growth. Now let me show you how this works in, pra in, in practice. Uber, great service. We love the service. And Uber was originally cheaper than Yellow Cab. You know, we loved it, got it, cheap. And Uber gained great market share. And then Uber did something. What did Uber do to that low price in order to pivot? They did something. They started to charge you surcharges. They said, oh my God. There's a search in demand. Okay, I'm gonna put 1.5 uh, multiplier on that. 2.1, 2.3, 2.5. Well, as it happens, human beings travel in generally during search hours. Uh, I mean, it's very common. This is when traffic jams occur. So they suddenly start to leverage that search during those traffic jams hours in order to do it. They essentially pivoted the model. They changed the model on you. They gained velocity at a high speed, and then they pivoted. Now that's the trick. Gain velocity, pivot the living crap out of it. <laughs> that is how they achieve that big window. Now they can only do that if they get lots of funding. And boy, Uber gets lots of funding. I think I saw another 200 million funding round. There's a couple of companies that you don't want to put on your trigger list. Uber, or Slack, because they're coming out of news all the time, and Netflix. If you have those people on your News feeds, and you pretty much have nothing but feeds from them. Does this make sense? Is there any question about this? And you can raise your hand, and I'll repeat the question and all that stuff. Okay. 
moving forward. How do we do this? Now, let's talk first about where this growth comes from. And I want to give you an idea where growth comes from. First of all, folks, startup is not two people surfing on a couch having a great idea. We have plenty of those here in Amsterdam already. Those are not startups. Those are pre-something. If we keep calling those kids startups, then we are not doing a service to them and we're not doing a service to everybody else who thinks they're startups. Because those things have failure rates that are beyond reasonable. At a startup, you have to have some product fit. Just waking up one morning and sticking $5,000 in your pocket from your uncle and going to develop is not a startup. That is something early on and it's quite fine, but make sure that if you call that a startup, you're gonna have an issue because people say, well, the failure rate of those startups is pretty high. It's not the case. Startups, you have to have some revenue associated with that. If that you use that as a metric, I'm quite fine. You don't have to be profitable. I just want to see some revenue. But these early stages where you're in development are not startup. They are brain phases, whatever you want to call them, development, innovation, you can call it, but they're not startups. In these phases, you get friends and family money. Friends and family are nice, and you should treat them nice, but that money they probably never get back. The seed round probably is the guy you met at the bar, you know, like he said, man, I love your idea. I want to be part of a startup. He gives you $10,000. Great. He probably never is going to see his money back. Okay. So those rounds, as you go through that, they're great and they get you kickstarted, but make sure that that's not startup. But startup is what happens next. Startup is what happens here. This unpredictable growth. This unpredictable growth is something we need to learn about. And we're going to go in detail about that in a second. Following this unpredictable growth, we're going to go and we traditionally go grow this on. This is a weakness I will identify in the Dutch economy we got to tackle right now. Otherwise, all the startups that we come from will never get there. So what we need to do is we need to go in rapid growth. We need to grow really fast, almost as fast as I talk right now. We need to go really fast. This rapid growth is part of making really your company valuable. And whether you're at a large company, a Fortune 500, or whether you're just a startup that has achieved its first uh, revenue sources. This rapid growth is the key part of everything. Following that, you have sustainable growth. That sustainable growth is beyond my area of expertise because I get bored with that. This is the part where it's like not exciting anymore. Yeah, not exciting. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit to step you through this. What do we see in this part of growth? Here we see unpredictable part of growth. In this part, those blue areas, can be complete product adjustments. As the gentleman before me spoke about, we can completely change the business during that process. It's quite fine. If our customers say we want something different, then you build something different on top of the platform that you've built. If your customers say, hey, you know, like after you've been 20, 20 customers, which you see you can't scale beyond that, you need to change the pricing model, you change the pricing model. You make adjustments. Making those adjustments is critical. The problem with that, is you got to do successful failures. This is a big issue we face this a lot here. The Dutch economy does not allow for failures. The Dutch DNA does not believe that failure is a great thing. I've seen this all the time. Johnny failed. <laughs> Johnny got $20,000, he never made it. Johnny failed. My sister ran, there, ran a startup, failed. You know what happened to her? She had to pay the, the government, her boss then had to pay the government for three years. Then the government for three years looked if she was living accordingly and would pay her. That's what happened to a Dutch startup. Like, I'm like, wow, failure. Absolutely, we gotta change the behavior in here and we gotta let people recognize that in startup, failing is an absolute must have. Why? Failures outnumber success ratios three to one. Now let me show you that example of how that goes. In order to fail, I gotta, I gotta think about this. I gotta, I don't wanna fail, I don't wanna fail. I'm constricted, I don't wanna fail. Does any of you play chess? Come on, somebody. Yeah, chess. Now if I think, if I'm a chess player, and I think two steps ahead of the game, and you think three steps ahead of the game, then you're gonna win, right? And so then I need to think four steps ahead of the game, and you need to think five steps ahead of the game, and then you're gonna win again, right? In Western society, in every education that you get, here in Western Europe, you are essentially being trained how to be a chess player. I need to think it through what I'm gonna do, and then we're gonna do that. No, that's not right, I'm gonna do that. Yeah, that's a luxury, but then that they are gonna do this, okay, and then I'm gonna do that, oh, that's not good, okay, back, back, back. I'm gonna do this, then I'm gonna do that, and I'm gonna do this. Oh. 
And they keep thinking about that. Well, here's what we do in the US. We play Angry Birds. Aim, shoot, fire, miss. Aim, shoot, fire, miss. Aim, shoot, fire, hit. Yeah, next level. Aim, shoot, fire, miss. Aim, shoot, fire, miss. Aim, shoot, fire, hit. Yeah, next level. Hey, Johnny, how's the chess game going for you? Keep thinking, okay? Aim, shoot, fire, miss. These rapid iteration is essentially critical because the two misses made us learn. We, our misses outnumbers our wins, and we need to make sure we learn of those misses. We need to embrace them. So we cannot just fund successful startups. That is a failure from the get-go. We need to fund lots of losing startups. We need to fund in these kids that are gonna fail. And we need to be perfectly fine with it. Perfectly fine. Failure is great. This, I'll skip this topic for today, because the earlier group, I just wanted to say earlier on, we had a group here of students. And I had to tell them, stop the fucking hacking. Because what they're doing is they're getting to this point by hacking the living crap out of it. But if they hack, they don't learn from these lessons. They figured out a way how to get to that million dollar zone or that one million ARR really fast. But if you do that right now, you still have to learn those lessons later on. And those lessons later on are a lot more expensive. You can't hack your way to success. You gotta go through the learning process of talking to a customer, understanding what the problem is. Now, if I figured out that if I send out one email, uh, if I send out a thousand emails and one customer returns and buys something from me, and I get to 100 customers by sending 100,000 emails, that is not building a successful business model. You essentially started scaling your failure rate. Because one out of 100 means you had 99 people that you didn't talk to or that didn't like it. If you do that 1,000 out of 100,000, whatever, you are sending 99,000 people that you are churning through your database. You cannot scale failure. Growth hacking is generally scaling failure. There are some differences. I'm not saying that you can occasionally use it. It is not a growth strategy. It's a pure hacking tactic. If you continue this journey, then you're gonna see the following. Essentially, what we have to learn, what we have to understand that selling that I'm gonna to talk to you about today has not changed. It has not, okay, from this perspective. What has changed is the buying process. First things first, what we see down here is that if you hook your business onto the internet, if you launch a website, essentially you're addressing a global audience. Whether you like it or not, the moment you have an internet website, you're selling globally. Now, that doesn't mean that if somebody calls you from Hong Kong and says, I want to buy from you, that you're going to say, you know, that you have to sell to them. You have, an answer, you have to have an answer for them. But you're essentially a global business. You have 10x the buyers right now. If you're selling B2B SaaS, just get ready because people are buying B2B SaaS right now everywhere, here in Europe, in, uh, in Latin America, in Australia. This growth is creating a 10x the amount of buyers. Next thing, we see the expenditure go up radically. The example that I use here is that at this point in time, I represent about 70 to 100 companies in my portfolio. All of them by Salesforce. I've never seen a Salesforce guy. Literally, I've never seen one. I wouldn't recognize him. I'm certain that he has like this gigantic do not go sign over it or something like that, right? But I've never seen him. People are buying $70,000 software on the internet without ever, ever seeing or met the salesperson. Why you trust the brand? So the market has changed. The market says, A, there are more buyers, and B, they're buying at a significantly higher price than we ever thought of before. And you experience that at home too. Previously, you only bought up to $100 online. Nowadays, maybe you're willing to buy $1,000 online. For me, if I can buy right now a Ford, the car that I want, I'd be more than welcome to pay for it, never meet, never meet any of the salesperson. I would be quite happy to pay them what, uh, the best price. So what we see is that the third one, the next thing that we see is that the sales cycles are shortening up. Now, if you see the sales cycle shortening up from six to 18 months originally down to like 30 to 60 days right now, that is a significant acceleration. That changes everything. Now, here's the problem. That thing gives us exponential growth potential. This growth potential, global audience, buying more of dollar value and faster is essentially what's driving this rapid growth. Remember the previous chart, the two by two? That is the one that is fueling to the right. Our customers are saying to us, we're willing to buy faster. But our sales organization, in many cases, are not suited to that speed. Not even by a heartbeat. And so, 
what do we need to do is we need to start learning how to build that sales organization. First, we have to understand that the sales organization can't create a need. I hear this too often, is we have this unique product, our salespeople are gonna create a need. No, you can't. The need needs to already be there. You can uncover it, you can point to it, you can dig into the people that have the need, but you can't create it. You can't go to somebody and says, you know, like, look, I know you don't need that third leg right now, but I'm gonna sell you a third leg. You're gonna need it. No, it's not gonna happen. If somebody lost this leg, then of course you can understand that there's a prosthetic uh, sale potential. But you can't sell something they don't have a need for. Understand that matching that need that does exist is really what the key role of sales is. If that demand is there right now, then sales need to be able to meet that demand. Sales essentially is, gives you the ability to meet a rapid growing demand. The closer you get to here, this one is better than that one. The closer you get to here, the better you do. These are like three growth curves. You see, if you're slightly later, you have a slightly less of a growth curve. Meeting that demand at the highest speed possible is the essence of your sales organization. Hence, when I said earlier, if you, won the mar if you grew 380%, but the market grew by 800%, then you didn't deliver as a sales leader as promised. The problem with that is that the window of opportunity, many think it's here, because this is how we perceive it. This window of opportunity is when several of the people are already starting and they started selling. But the true window of opportunity is right there. That window of opportunity, this window here, in a traditional conventional sale can be years, one year or two years. When you're selling at high velocity, we're talking out about a window as, as long as six to 12 months. If you move out of that window, you're gonna have some challenges. You miss the window. Here's one of the next thing, things that happen. If you miss that window, we call you the walking dead. We have lots of them. Storm wanted to give me a challenge, gave me one of their walking dead companies and said, go do something with it. You do not want to be given that task. I, I tried, I did it, but you know, like it's not a good thing. A walking dead is a seven to eight year old company that from its conception date that is still selling a valuable service, is currently rated 13 or 14 in the market, heavily loaded on venture capital money and debt, and you need to sell it because they just want to get their money out of it, right? And here's what happens. Because a lot of us have become part of those companies, or have one way or another choose, we are being recruited for such a company or whatever it is. These companies say, one more, one more shot, one more deal, one more round of funding, one more opportunity. We're there, we're close. One of the statements that hurts a lot of people, it's a well-known statement, is killing us. It's quitting is not an option. Fuck it, quitting is a great option. You got to quit. You gotta be ready to pull the fucking plug out, fuck up business, take all the lessons and restart. If you're not willing to do that, you're not gonna learn. You'll continue to be a walking dead. You have to quit. Quitting is a great option. Now, what we see with startups, the companies that are going through this motion here, is there's three key problems. Problem number one, they gotta be good at identifying the need. For those of you who are founders of companies, you fuckers are good at this. This is what you do really well. This is exactly what you were built to do. You were meant to do it. You understand this. You built the need for it. You're great at this. If I put you on the spot, you tell me exactly why you develop your service. You know exactly what the problem is. You're really good at this. Then the scaling is the second issue. You gotta hit that growth curve right. And then the third one is when you grow, you gotta execute on that growth curve. These are the three things that you need. As I said before, you're good at this. You get three thumbs up. But this one pretty much suck. Right now what we see down here is companies missing that window all the time. Why? I'm not feeling it. My gut feel tells me no. I'm not feeling it, right? Well, hang on. Are there signals that we can determine that that window is occurring? Because it would be great if, if there was a magical window that you, sh oh, I'm shifting in it. This week, I'm going into the scaling window. Well, there's three signals that you can use. Signal, signal number one, if you're currently selling a service at 
or we were actually with a company earlier this week. They were selling a $10,000 service annual recurring revenue last year. And they came to us and said, are we in this window? And I'm like, what are you selling a service at? Oh, right now it's like $80,000 a year. Sorry, you eight-folded your annual revenue from a single customer? Yes. Well, you're in the freaking window. Really, you are. If you get eight times more money from the same deal, that means your, their demand has gone up, right? And the second thing that determines that, if your sales cycle has shortened up, and I'm not you're meaning like it went from 82 to 79 <laughs> days. No, traditionally it was 164 days, and now we're seeing that you're not selling at what? At 78 days or something like that. Your sales cycle is shortening up. You're in the window. And the third one is, your conversion rate is up. No, I didn't say your inbound leads went up, because your inbound leads can be dependent on it. Your conversion rate went up. Your conversion rate from lead to whatever qualified lead or win went up. What do these three things have in common? Well, these three things have in common that they're based on data. It's measured, it's understood. But the problem is that we see out there, for those of you who are VPs of sales, <laughs> is that you're telling me that you're trying to tell me that you're trusting your gut. But your gut as a VP of sales is generally built over a career of like 20 years, of which the previous 16, 17, as it relates to speeding up, do not apply anymore. I do like your insight, I do like it, but this is playing a whole different game. You used to run a marathon. I'm not trying to show you how to run a mile. You're telling me, no, I can't, I can't run early if, uh, fast in the beginning because I got another 20 X miles to go. And I'm telling you, dude, it's only one mile race. Give it everything you got right now. Different race, different thing. We, he telling me his gut is, right, is wrong. And I'm saying it has nothing to do with your gut. The data is telling me it's right. Now, if the gut and the data line up, beautiful thing. If the gut says one thing and data says another thing, I'm inclined to believe the data these days. But that's me. Third one is we have to execute sales during this growth here. As we make that turn, as we hit the window, it must be executed properly. And this is where, again, this is what probably where the biggest issue comes across. A lot of you have sales teams. Sales teams are getting younger. I, the other day, I have a company that we are training 50 salespeople on, 50 or 60 people. Okay? We charged them $25,000 of sales training. The VP of sales thought it was too much money. You're training 50 to 60 salespeople once a year to do something right, and you think $25,000 is worth the money. Why? It comes from the traditional concept that sales training is given during the sales kickoff, which is during the start of the year. Which means if you give a sales training during the start of the year, the results are generally measured at the end of the year. Who in the world remembers that the sales results were due to the training in the beginning of the year? They're a maximum distance. So there we, we have never learned how to look really at training as an ROI. We right now say the following, and I've yet to be proven wrong on these companies. I'll give you four salespeople with training, and they will beat five salespeople without training any given day of the week. We actually are moving now more and more to four days of work with a fifth day of training. Because the salespeople that we're bringing in the organization are a lot younger, because that's in SaaS service what we can afford. We have to think differently. That means that we're in order to execute sales, I'm not only giving it three Death Stars, I'm giving like complete five skulls. This is where we see a lot of people making mistakes. They're hiring experienced salespeople that cannot keep up with the velocity. Now, I'm not gonna go over that person's head because I'm gonna ruin the relationship. Ditsky, if you can't go over the, the person's head and you ruin the re relationship, I got to close a deal. The relationship sometime was not meant to be in the first place. We don't have 18 months for you to go layer up, layer up, layer up. Send a value as proposal straight to the CEO and get that thing going. <coughs> These are very disruptive things and I know that they come to you as disruptive. We're in hyper growth. We need to get this going. I'd rather have a no right now than to wait on a potential yes six months from now. Give me a no right now and I can deal with it. Don't drag all my resources along for another six months to come to the conclusion that I already knew where I was, I was headed for, and most likely a no. So what we see down here is that in order to do this, we got to develop and understand the new customer experience. And I'm gonna explain this a little bit. Step number one, we are going from a selling process to something totally different. 
What we are facing, what we are dealing with, what everyone in this room is struggling with right now, is a hundred plus year culture built out to something against this. This something is you sell, you close, you get paid, you buy the BMW. You sell, you close, you pay, you get the BMW. <coughs> this is critical. This funnel process is the process that runs the entire sales. <laughs> All companies, and they have nice stages, that you can name them differently, but the culture is still the same. The culture is so much the same that you actually pay the people for this. Coffee is for closers, all that stuff has happened. Uh, right? ABC, always be closing. Hallelujah. No way. And so what we see down here is there are more stages today. In SaaS, the key problem is not to get the purchase order. The purchase order often is kind of like, you know, like particularly in media sales, you can get the purchase order easy. The key actually is, going through five experiences. And let me tell you what those five experiences are. Experience number one, the customer doesn't wake up in the morning and says, Mike, hey, can you upgrade me from unqualified opportunity to qualified opportunity because I'm really digging it, man. You gave a great sales pitch last night. He doesn't go like that, right? Actually, I never had a call like that. That would be funny. The customer goes, oh shit, I have a problem. So as he experiences that he has a problem, Right? He comes to the conclusion, aha, eureka, aha, Elevnis, I have a solution. Now this comes from my experience where I was um, in London at Paddington Hilton. I'm in a Friday morning and I want to get home. And as many of you travel, when you go out on a Monday on an outbound, it's like, please upgrade, please window if I want to sleep, or on the peeing lane, center lane if I need to pee a lot, right? as far to the front as possible. If you want to go home on a Friday, it's going like, dude, I'll take any seat. You know, put me in the center, in the back, I'll take it, right? Sun Tzu says, never stand on an, uh, between an army on his way home. It can be really dangerous. I am standing there. I need to get home. Paddington. I tap on the, the or go to the, to the cab ride. I ask the cab driver, hey, can you drop me off at London Heathrow? He looks at me and says, sir, I'm not going to do it. This is some traffic stuff going up right now, and you're going to be bitching and moaning in my ear the whole time we're not going to make it, because we're not going to be able to make it. And I go, oh shit, I'm going to miss my flight. And I don't want to miss my flight. As I'm, you know, as I'm like confused and you know, crossing some consternation, the concierge of the Hilton pops on my shoulder and says, like, may I ask what's going on here? And I'm explaining to him the situation, and he goes like, sir, the London Heathrow Express right downstairs. Aha, I go to the London Heathrow Express office, buy my ticket. That cab was gonna cost me 65 quid. The London Heathrow Express charges you 18 quid. Wow, and I'm gonna get there in 22 minutes? Wow, okay, upgrade me. How much does the upgrade cost? 28 quid, I'll take it. It's half the cab of the price, I'll take it. 28 quid, wow. Cheaper, better, quicker, I'm loving this. Wow experience. Next thing I go is I go through the Yeehaw experience. As I arrive there on time, I think to myself, wow, this is in time. I'm there. Yeehaw. Buy some chocolates for my wife, Maureen. Bought something for my kids. Yeehaw. And finally, I come to the fifth experience. Oh my God, as I take off. Why don't I know? What the heck? Does everybody go through this experience? I never heard anything about this. Well, these are the five experiences your customer goes through. These are the five experiences that you need to learn how to think in. Customers don't wake up in the morning to place a purchase order. Customers' problems need to be solved. And I think that is the definition of the new sales generation. They need to solve primarily your problem. After I solve that problem, if I re-tackle all of this being a problem solver, then the next thing I do, I need to ask, not pitch. Sales teams out there are constantly being trained. Pitch, pitch, pitch. But if I have a problem, then how are you going to find out about my problem? How are you going to find out about my problem, sir? Ask a question. If you ask a question, it's amazing what happens. Asking a question is essential to selling. So why in the world are we teaching people every day how to pitch? You need to learn pitch training. Guys, you know, like I've been in sales 20 years. And I never had given an elevator pitch in my life. Like, I don't know why we're teaching them elevator. 30 seconds, 60 seconds, two minute pitches. I don't get it. 
Now, if you do that as a homework exercise so they get to know your value prop, great. But that's not a top three skill that they need to have. All they need to learn is you know, things that they can learn otherwise. What I want them to do <laughs> is to learn how to ask questions so they can diagnose the problem. Prescription before diagnosis is malpractice, people. You can't sell something if you don't sell it to the right problem. It's malpractice. Now, for years, I mean, like for decades, I think, in the medical uh, space, it's considered uh, a legal offense. In sales, we called it an art. Johnny can sell eyes to Eskimos. Johnny can. Johnny is the rainmaker at this company. We can live in that world. So what we need to do is we need to teach our salespeople to ask the right questions. Instead of having them train the pitch, what we believe is very important is, are they able to identify 10 key questions per persona in their journey? Are they able, if you have a, a product, are they able to identify those 10 questions? This is the new skill set. Can they ask the right questions? What we see down here is the outbound. At this point in time, we're looking at new outbound approaches. I don't know if you have ever received one of these already. Right now, we are deploying industrial technology to create industrial grade outbound. This means pretty much that any company with about $50 to spare every month can send you 18 emails. Why? Because we have determined measurements currently indicate that it takes about eight emails for you to open up and to respond with something. Therefore, we now create what we call 18 point cycles. I sent you an email, you ignore it. I sent you an email, you ignore it. I sent you an email, you ignore it. I sent you an email, you get really ignored, but you clicked on it accidentally. And then the link, you were fucked up, you, you tried to do it, okay. And this goes on and on and on. Essentially, those 18 emails without proper training do the following. You wanna buy from me? Do you wanna buy from me? Ditsky, do you wanna buy from me? Jaco, I haven't heard from you in a while. Do you wanna buy from me? Jaco, are you still there? Should I stay or should I go? Jaco, there's a really cool clip that I have for you. Check out this GIF of, of cats stumbling. Do you want to buy from me? Like, what is going on with all these, like, I have a solution to sell you. Do you want to buy from me? These volume-based tactics are essentially teaching our clients to ignore us. And you do this every day as you open up your iPhone, swipe left. You go through it, swipe left, swipe left, swipe left. You know, you recognize already the perpetrators. You're too lazy to hit the unsubscribe, so you just delete them. And every morning when you wake up, you think to yourself, I should unsubscribe to them today. <laughs> By the way, I made it, sorry, too much info kind of situation, okay? I made it a goal that every morning when I go to the bathroom, sorry, I'll use the unsubscribe button. And that's my time to unsubscribe the living crap out of all these people. Like, I'm gonna fight this model, unsubscribe. So, I'm gonna show you what a modern way of communication looks like. Because if it's not this, it is this. Now, in this approach, what we see down here is we are essentially sharing insights first and foremost. Consider writing a blog post the same amount as approximately 10 emails. When I write 10 emails, I can write a blog post. Since you are writing probably hundreds of emails every day, or at least a couple hundred, then you can write a blog post. That blog post gets posted. You, sir, if you send me an email, how long do you think it lives in my inbox? A day. How do you long a blog post lives? Forever. This is the beauty. The beauty is this blog post lives on a different cycle. It doesn't live in, on an, it's not an email that gets sent out anymore. So by writing is now, as we teach these young salespeople, their first response is, I don't know what to write about. Because writing a blog post is really difficult. Well, one, maybe we should hire for that skill because we are living in a world that wants to communicate through text more than they want to communicate through voice. Or two, I asked him a question. And you can ask anyone who ever brings you that. Well, how many people did you talk to this week? You know, you just started on a month. How many customers did you communicate with? Oh, I communicated with like 10, 15 customers. And what was the common problem that you found? Oh, they all had this problem, this problem, this problem. Great, write about that. Write about that. Say, I worked here for this company for 30 days and I've learned this about the market. Write about that. People love authentic things like that. That will get the attention. Now, I'm asking you if this is follows. I ask you to do the following. I'm asking you that when you are writing this blog post, 
to trust one thing. In many cases, they're the evil. In this case, they're the great thing. In the great thing, trust Google. If you write a blog post in which you highlight problems, trust Google to find the people who are looking for solutions to those problems. If you trust in that, your life will be a lot easier. I tell you right now, your response rate here is low 2%, okay? So it's not like we've got to do a lot in order to make this better. We don't have to do like an extraordinary amount. We just have to do a little bit. Being 4% would be better. Now, when you write that blog post, I don't want you to write, this is problem number one, and here's how we solve it. This is problem number two, and here's how we solve it. This is problem number three, and here's how we solve it. Because that essentially is you are still selling. It requires a different technique, and we're gonna talk about that in a second. What you see down here is after the client engages with the blog post, then you pitch, then you can go out to them, and then you can reach out, you can like, you can share, and so on, okay? Then I'm gonna check in with LinkedIn. How are we on time? I wanna make sure I can do a quick demo. Yeah, okay, I get the thumbs up. Okay, I wanna show you how the demo works. In this case, we can determine that somebody has a particular profile. So I'm going to home, I'm looking advanced, and I'm pulling up a lead list. LinkedIn gives me the ability to do safe searches. So I'm gonna add, call on the safe search list here, and I'm gonna say, I want every SaaS CXO BD, I got 78 new leads in with this week. Here's what I'm gonna do. As I, what we found, what do you guys think is the most viewed page on LinkedIn, besides the homepage? Who viewed my profile? Okay, so what we're now gonna do is I got uh, X amount of leads here. I'm just gonna make 400 outbound calls over the next couple of minutes. What I'm now doing right now, this LinkedIn will now start visiting 400 people that I deem to be my target audience. And on that LinkedIn page, as they have visited them, as they now attempted to visit me, so what they're doing is they essentially are visiting lead after lead after lead. 400 a day. That means that essentially, I can 400 times 22 working days, I can visit 8,800 leads. Am I, am I interrupting them during the day? Am I sending them something? No, all I'm doing is I'm visiting them. Now this requires certain adjustments to your profile. Your profile needs to be set up as a professional. And so what we now are doing is we're training sales people to essentially dress up before they step into a meeting. We're essentially telling them, look, Ditsky, if you go to a banking, uh, then I want you in suit and tie. If you go into Silicon Valley, I want you cool and hip. But that dress code now needs to be done online. I need to be able to look at you, trust you, think you're authentic, and see it if you have value. If you have, those two if you have all those things, then when you visit my profile, I'll visit you back. Now, if I visit you back, I essentially, when we visited each other, we essentially had a digital communication. It was an outbound call I placed by visiting your profile, to which you responded by visiting my profile, to which I can now go outbound with an email. Thank you for visiting my profile and which I respond, did you like any of the information you saw on my profile? Now I'm gonna up it up a notch, that is level three. I'm gonna go up a notch level five, six, 10, 11. Why, because when they visited me, I figured it out. Dude, that was a hot lead. That was the guy from so and so, so now I'm gonna hyper-personalize it. Mike, thanks for visiting my profile. In your thank you statement, I noticed that you were targeted with growth of blah, blah, blah. Have you read this article? Uh, did you like the article I put on my blog post? This insight, blah, 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 this article, this link. What did you think about it? You betcha that it has a communication rate that exceeds less than 2% of cold outbound emails and phone calls. I am now targeting the audience that I want to talk to. I trusted Google to connect to them. This is an indication of where we can go with these modern sales forces. If any of you are going to buy this tool, I don't think this tool is legal. I think that LinkedIn is, uh, LinkedIn is going to shut it up. So make sure that you not necessarily buy an annual subscription because I don't see that completely happening yet. <laughs> 
But we're using it. It's, got, it's $59.95. No, we do not take cuts on that deal. We just use the tool. Uh, the tool is called Auto Autopilot for LinkedIn. The other tool is called eLink. Both of them do the same thing. What we see down here is you check each other out, share customized insight, and then you can set up a call. This, as you, as you go up down here, is you sharing knowledge. It's based on your ability to share your insights and your knowledge. And that gives you an identification on what you're doing down here. You're not no longer, you're asking, you're not pitching, you're writing, you're not calling. You're writing blog posts, you're writing things. In this process, you do the, the fourth part. You're educating, you're never selling, you're educating. I want to show you what it feels like for a customer when they go through a switch from an educational to a sales perspective. Folks, do you feel like this is a form? And give me an I. Am I educating you right now? Do you feel this is an educational pitch? Yeah? Everybody agree? Yeah, I see a lot of that. Yes, please, right? Yeah, okay. Well, I faked you out. Please buy my book. $89.95, available on Amazon. I want to thank you all for coming. That is when it turns into a sales pitch. And you feel like, what? This was a sales pitch? It was about the best sales pitch I could give, by the way, but it was a sales pitch. Okay, that is when I turn it from an educational experience to a sales experience. This is exactly what happens when you're trying to solve that problem and you go like, man, you gotta take a look at that product because we have much shit to shell. We can really solve your problem, right? You're not there yet. You still have to educate. So the primary thing is we want to educate, not sell. Now, big thing here. <laughs> when can I sell? Because I need to sell. Yes, when the education is complete, when the problem is understood, then I want you to sell the living crap out of it. And I want you to reduce it to the absolute simplest thing that you can have. Sir, is this a problem that we diagnose it correctly? Yes. May I ask? If we offer this to you at $25,000, can you make a decision today? No, I can't. Can you make a decision on Friday? Yes, probably. What does it take for, us for you to commit on Friday? It takes this, this, this. Why? You've earned it. You've earned it. What we have learned in the world is not to ask for the order. We learned for the world to ask for the order after we didn't earn it. If you earned it, if you educated it, if you gave everything you've got at that deal, then you believe that you have earned to ask for the order. It's okay. Customers love it when you ask for the order at that point in time because you've earned it. Now, occasionally, there's somebody who won't like it. That's okay. That is okay. Work with a deal of it. But you've earned it at that point in time. A few other points I like to point out here is that you try not demo. Customers don't want to demo. This is treacherous territory that I'm on. I just want to open your eyes and think to yourself, does a demo really help my sale? Because a lot of times it doesn't. A lot of times it hurts you more than it helps you. I want you to you know, think about as how we share a story. What do we do to share that story, not a PowerPoint? This week we had several uh, companies trying to pitch us, sometimes uh, not voluntary, I might add. But as they are pitching us, they're pr ripping out their PowerPoint decks. There is no PowerPoint deck. We were with one company that asked for our help. And what they do in that company is they sell uh, pumps that help infant babies breathe. Very specific process, the rate is extremely high and so on. The first six slides on the deck is this is who we are. This is the research that we've done. This is our map of the world with all the offices that we have. And we're sitting there like, look, dude, give me, you know, like, when is he starting with this story, right? And then somewhere, two thirds down the line, I'm like, oh, he's making baby pumps. What we say is, Dutsky, pull that story up front. Say the why first. Explain to us. Make it a story. The best way to describe this is when I ask you to tell me a story about your customer, I don't want to hear, oh, here's what we do for HBO, or here's what we do for uh, Telco XYZ. That's not a story. We don't tell stories about logos. I want to hear Mary at so-and-so, the vice president of this, she experienced this particular problem. And so when I re write my blog post with my three problems, when I say problem number one that I found was X, it's followed up. Mary bought at this company so-and-so. She really had this particular struggle. And when I first heard about her issue, I was trying to understand what, is it, what it was about. And then I heard from John at company XYZ, and he had the same issue. 
But it's becoming clear to me that these issues are prevalent throughout all these customers. Now you're talking a story. You're talking a story about human beings. Stories are about human beings. We need to talk that story. What you see is that as a skill set, what we need to do more and more, if we look at the skill set differences that we have, we predominantly have been hiring hunters and challengers. We've been hiring soccer players, preferably strikers. We love soccer player strikers. Why? Aggressive. They must be able to win. They are winners. What we found is that when you hire those people and we teach them cold calling, pitching, challenging, negotiations, and closing was the primary way that they were, that were, they were trained on. Today, we're looking for problem solvers, people who share insights with content. We're looking for people who ask questions, who have customer story, have a conversation, and, and are truly focused on solving a customer problem. These are mountain bikers. These are people that don't compete against an opponent. These are the people that are still competitive, but they primarily compete against themselves. The ABC of closing has been revised. It's not always be closing, it is always be curious. Ask questions, learn more. And do all this online. High velocity, we don't have time to travel, we don't have time to check in, do all this stuff. It all has to happen online. Now, at this point in time, I am happy to report, this is the only time I can do this, that if I think of a bunch of people that love to ask questions, that love to tell stories, that love to talk, well, and that love to problem solve, this is a skill set that we have in the Netherlands. This is something we can excel at. We fixed a few of these things, but this essentially is us fuckers, we love to do all this, right? We love to do this, so we do have it in the nature. So as you look at the skill set, I want to ask you, I think that more and more we are moving away from the er uh, traditional American always be closing mindset. We're moving in a total different direction. As we move forward and we see what is the next thing we need to do here, is it 50 minutes or an hour? I don't know of you, but any one of your companies that is throwing one hour webinars, please don't. Please, just whenever, first of all, the word webinar gives me like, like the runs. It's not a good thing, right? Fifth, 60 minute webinars and generally go something like this. First of all, the quality is shitty. You know why? Because they didn't want to prepare. So I'm sitting through eight minutes of somebody telling me who they are, where they're from, trying to establish credibility. Dutsky, I was already on the call, okay? I didn't know all that. Then I'm getting the agenda, and this is where I'm getting intrigued, right? Because I'm looking at that agenda, multi-point, and I'm trying to judge from that, from that agenda, approximately in time, I have to move my one-hour indicator to hit. The thing. I'm not the only one, right? <laughs> I, I'm like, okay, well, man, that's five minutes per topic. I'm gonna approximately go to 35 minutes to listen what the crap is going on, right? And then I'm gonna go move back and forth, and I don't know, I'm like, oh, I'm confused, fuck it, I'm done with this, right? This is a one hour webinar. We don't need one hour webinars. What we need is 50 minute webinars. Get to the point, if I wanna know who you were and how credible you were, put the LinkedIn and I'll go check it out. I am interested to learn about who you are after I learned what you had to say, not before. Okay? I don't need credibility up front anymore. I need what you gotta bring me up front. 15 minutes. I want you to think, what would happen if you reduce your entire sales process and pitching to 50 minute meetings only? Half your decks could be screwed up. They'd go like, no, that deck doesn't work. 26 slides, not gonna work. 26, yeah, it's not gonna work. Well, unless we speak really fast. So what we're now gonna do is we're gonna teach people to speak really fast. I'm good at that. <laughs> Okay, so 50 minutes. Restructure your thinking about 50 minute calls. Ah, oh, skip one, I'm sorry. Now, not next week. Customer calls you up, I wanna to talk to you. Great. You wanna go online right now? Yeah, sure. Or customer shows up, says I wanna talk. Sure, can I come by next week? Yeah, why not? I want now versus next week. I want now any time of day, okay? We don't ask, oh, can we meet now? Oh, you called me? Well, let me pop up a screen share, boom. And I'm not putting screen share, join with me and all that shit because that stuff makes my life as horrible as anything. I'm open up Google Doc, click share. Hey, the link is in your email, click copy. You can see how I take notes. Let's have a meeting right now. Now, now versus next week. 
If I have to say at any point in time, well, Mark, the specialist, is not available, but he is available to you next week at this back and call, no, not good. You're delaying your sale. You've got to build an organization that can act in the now. Because the now is what they want. They called you, they, they reached out to you, they have a problem now, you solve it right now. If a customer responds to you and says, I want to talk to you, sure, does five minutes from now work? It's amazing what customers think about that. If you show you care about them, they will show they care about you. Now versus next week. And as I come closer and closer to the end of this presentation, I want you to start that we see firsthand the rise of a new generation of sales. And we're gonna show that to you where that generation is coming from. Down here, this is a conventional sales organization. Web sales is pretty much sits at the low end. If you have a service online, it is that service that you can buy with a credit card, also known as internet sales. There's no human involved directly during the purchase. Human beings are involved, but primarily on the back end. You don't see them in the front end. That's web sales. Second thing that we see down here is conventional inside sales. These are people, banks, that are calling outbound, modern, more modern, they're doing outbound volume emailing. And these people, when you see them, and when you see them do this, then you start to understand that this volume metric is no longer working. If you ever talk to one, oh, I'm at a particular company. This particular company calls on C -A uh, C CXO officers. Oh, I almost said the wrong thing and then they would have known which company it was. CXO officers. There's this kid, Jonathan. And I'm teaching the team that day. Jonathan is an SDR. He's with the company about six weeks or something like that. And they're routing his traffic to my, my headset. And I see him on the floor, so I wave him, and he goes like, oh crap, Jocko's on the call, oh crap, Jocko's on the call, right? And because I'm listening in, right? And so, so he's dialing, and lo and behold, Jonathan gets a connect. A C, whatever, it was a Santa Cruz CXO officer. And Jonathan stumbled and fall, didn't know what to do. He was horrible. I mean, like, it, like he didn't even ask a question. He was pitching straight away. And the guy was responding to him like, uh, who are you? Who are you with? Why are we having this call, right? And Jonathan didn't know what to say to that. Boom. Ended really abruptly, call down. And I go like, dude, as I'm walking over, right? And he's making a scene. Oh, fuck, Jocko was on the call. I missed it horribly, right? I'm like, dude, don't worry. We do it all. It's okay, don't worry, all of us have that, right? So I'm like, do your best, do another one. And so he picks up, and I say like, what are you gonna do this time, I'm gonna do this, this, this. He picks up the phone, and he, does, and he, lo and behold, never happens over there, he gets another connect. He does the same shitty thing that he did before. And I go like, Dutsky, Dutsky, what the fuck is going on, <laughs> right? I told you what not to do. And he says, Jocko, I realize that, but you see that right now? I just hit two connects. If I hit five connects, I make $1,000 today, okay? I'm just looking for the connects. We go like, holy crap. Do you know how many of you are measuring the wrong thing, inducing the wrong behavior? It is happening all over the place. And these kids are not even being trained. Do I blame this kid? Not necessarily. Do I blame the freaking option? And oh, by the way, the reason why they installed that program for the day, because I was there and they wanted to see all this activity, I go like, can we take it down? No, it's up and running right now. We can't change the comp plan. So here I have 14 outbound sales reps calling CHRO just so they can talk crap to him, so to see how fast they could get on the line, right? Seriously, this happens out there. Seriously. I'm in a VP of marketing company. She's telling me that sales keep telling them that they need more leads. I go to the organization and see in sales, okay, what's going on? They're showing me that they're having sequences in email. I'm great. Show me a sequence. It is a pure, do you want to buy? Do you want to buy? Do you want to buy? I'm going back to the VP of marketing. I'm like, uh, I know what I have a lead. Did you check the scripts? She goes like, which scripts? Sorry, you have 24 SDRs pumping out scripts and nobody checked the scripts? Uh, well, somebody wrote them. Yes. You know where these kids get the scripts from? They Google them. <laughs> they Google them, and when they Google them, they land on Aaron Ross' predictable revenue model, which surrenders all kinds of nice scripts. From the, what is it, 2009 and, and 2010 time frame, these scripts are heavily outdated, wrong scripts. This is happening out there. This is what's happening here in this conventional inside sales team. 
The other part of the organization is the enterprise B2B sales team. Now, these are the professionals, and I respect them as well a lot. I don't want to diss on them. They actually know what they're doing. They are doing conventional, but consultative, challenger sales. They know how to ask questions, and they do. They're often a little bit older in age because they had to you know, carry like 10 years of experience into that job. They really know what they're doing. The problem is they don't operate at velocity. If you've ever seen a bunch of these guys, and I love them again, but if you look at the LinkedIn profile, it's like a trophy case. Aim, you know, hit quota, 120% quota, 140% quota. I actually never missed a quota in the last six years or something like that, right? I'm like, wow, <laughs> something is up down there. But this point of view is that these salespeople are great. They have the skill set. It just doesn't translate online. And sometimes I put these folks on the spot looking at the LinkedIn profile. I'm like, you have this great personality. What I see down there is like an empty profile. Why is that? whole different world. They cannot make the translation. They are not selling at a high space. So as I see, where are we moving forward? Well, moving forward, we see that that part of sales, web sales will continue to grow. If you're getting used to buying 995, which I think my Microsoft right now is 995 a month, right? Uh, my Adobe is a certain amount a month. My Prezi is a certain amount a month. All these are coming in at the monthly uh, service. We will see more and more web sales like that will occur. The price will go up. We will become more used soon to buy $1,000 a month services. It will just be part of the game. Web sales will be up. Second thing that we will see is this will go down. It is not that we don't need these folks. We desperately need them. They are very skilled. But we need them to close the big deals, not the high velocity uh, volume deals. What you see in there is that that cold outbound, that we don't need as much of anymore. We've already grown very tired of the approach of receiving dozens of emails and phone calls. What that leaves is the rise of a brand new generation of sales professionals, a generation that I am very, very excited about. These are also sales professionals. These sales professionals are 25 years old. These sales professionals live in the online domain. They love the online domain. They just lack training on how to sell. If you, res if you restrain them from that training, if you will keep them back from that training, they will not succeed. They depend on that. Now, previously, salespeople needed that training, didn't need that training, because you were operational as a sales professional no? in about the age of 35 to 40 year old. This is when you hit your prime. This is when you had 10 years of experience. You didn't need that training anymore. You said in the training, did you take anything away? Yeah, two or three things, but that's it. These kids die for training. They come out of school, they're hungry. Now, when most of us got our graduation, we got our, uh, did a proper dose, we did all our things, at least I did, by myself. And everything I, I saw everywhere around me, it was by myself. <coughs> Does that ring a bell? We did all did it by ourselves, most of us did. See? What we see out of school, coming out of school right now, they graduate in groups. They do their projects as a group. These kids come out of school, this is what they love. They love to work in groups. They love to be focused on a common goal. They love a lot of training, and I'm not saying that we need to train them five days a week, not, not like that, but they're very used to being trained. What we see, it has gone away from the sole contributor, the one hunter, the one going out there, and it's become a way different kind of sales force. That is the new generation. If you apply that new generation to this rapid growth, that is where you start to execute sales. If you learn the lessons, if you apply the lessons that you learned in this phase, that applying the lessons from this phase in there is the essence of growing at high velocity. It is the sales execution that gets you there, and it's the need for a new sales generation that you need. And with that, I'm going to open it up for questions. Questions? Yes, sir. Yes. The question is, if you have personas and you develop a question list by, uh, per persona, do you have to build a customized question list per persona? Is that right? And what kind of questions would you do? 
The technique we use is an advanced B2B sales technique that has been used for a long time. It's called question-based sales techniques. It's the understanding when you ask questions, they can come in different gradations. Uh, many of these kids don't know the difference between the questions. So they simply ask, how many employees do you have? How many do this? And it becomes more of an interrogation online. And so they need to learn you know, like how they get in that conversation to more of an implication form of a question. And I learned this from Chen, Chen Danila Kantan. Chandy was sitting beside me, and every time I was in a meeting and I was asking questions, the person on the other side didn't even listen to my question. He was already moving on. And then when Chandy asked the questions, you saw like every, the room got quiet. It's like, wow, that's a great question. Later on, I learned that one is referred to as situational and problem questions, and the other ones are more implication questions. They need to learn how to ask the implication questions. The great thing is, Implication questions are very common among entire customer groups. So once you've established a few implication questions, what would you do if this would happen? What would you do if that would happen? Once you give them and you arm them these questions, they essentially are learning how to ask the right question. But after, this is a key thing, and you know, like I can't say this enough for those of you who have folks like this, and this applies also to the other group. When you ask a question, you need to follow that up. You need to follow it up with listening. Because half the time, these fuckers, when I ask the question, they go like, man, that was a good question I asked. I love the question I asked. I'm like, dude, listen to the answer. Like, no, I'm, I'm still relishing in the great question I just asked, right? <laughs> and they go like, no, 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 listen to the question. And then the customer says something like, I don't have any particular interest in that. And they go like, okay, move on and move to the next question. I'm like, Dutsky, what did he say? I have no particular interest in that. Okay, what word stood out of that? Uh, no, no, particular. You respond, what is of particular interest? What is of particular interest to you? Or why is that of no particular interest? You use that word, you mirror, flip it back. Now, the reason why we're looking at that so closely right now is because all of us who grew up in the 90s and 2000s, we would do this, it's called mirroring. We would tilt our head, look to it, and we created empathy on the other side. We created a connection, a conversation. If he doesn't pick up this conversation when the customer says no, and he moves on, essentially the customer thinks to himself, he didn't listen to me. But if he picks up the question, uses the word, mirrors it around, they call it question, goes, the customer goes like, hmm, interesting, somebody's listening to me. Now you may think that these are very tiny, minute changes, okay? But through the course of a 50-minute conversation, it is these little changes, persistently, boom, 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 everything leaves professional, that makes you accelerate through that deal. It is a game of single percentages. It is a game of you know, one in three, bringing it up to one in two and a half, or one whatever you want to have. That's a great question. Thank you for asking the question. Yes, sir. Yeah, so your question is, hey, Jocko, great what you're talking about. First thing you say, don't call, and then we're talking about how to call, right? And that, doesn't that contradict? Yes, there's two parts of the sales. In the outbound, don't call. Cold outbound, don't do that. That is the part where you don't call. But then in the follow-up, remember when I go up to that particular time, then I want you to achieve a call as, as quickly as you can. But the voice-to-voice, -voice, person to person communication is way better. Once you're in that call, then ask questions. For example, if you would go call outbound and you would do ask questions, then the person would go like, what the fuck, man? Like, <laughs> you know, like, who are you? Why am I answering all these questions? They would never do that. So for the called outbound, I recommend write the post and step through that particular sequence. Then if you get interest and you get into the conversation, then ask the questions because you have progressed. They now see you as an educator and therefore you have the right or at least you're earning the right to ask those questions. Does that make sense? I would, you know, would, the question is, would it be better to write from your personal email than from your company email? I don't think that the, e writing it where, the email address where you're writing it from makes a lot of difference. I don't think people clicking on and see where the email addresses come from. But what your earlier point was, I do think it's important that your subject line is very, uh, very well. And I do think it is very important that you write your email well. Now, how many of, yeah, well, all of you use email. 
May I see a show of hands? Who has been educated on writing an email? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, and we wonder why we have an email problem. Right? You've not been educated. You've been given a tool, email, but you've never been educated. What we literally have to do with these kids, we have to write them how to write email, which is in short stands for research, reference, and request. Hi, Mike. Notice on your LinkedIn profile that you just, uh, notice on your LinkedIn profile that you were just got into the job. Congratulations. Reference. Mike, Jackie, similar to you at your, your predecessor at your company, she really enjoyed this particular briefing on the topic. Please enjoy, click link insight. Mike, let me know if any questions arise. I'd love to educate you on the solution that we have deployed inside your company. Research, reference, and request. That structure of an email, that by itself, is one of the biggest ROI moments that when we put that into play, it is a proven technique. Show me you've done your research. Talk to me on behalf of a customer story that acts as a reference. Then insert some insight so I have something of value. Give me something before you want to take from something. And then insert your request. Research, reference, and request. The best of the best can bring that down to what one, two sentences. You feel like, man, he's doing that really well. We are teaching, these kids need to be trained how to communicate. It's amazing, but if we communicate in the written language, then we gotta educate them on that. Do you think this is important? Well, if you are about to give this kid an email tool that allows him to send a thousand emails during the week, batch him up, you better tell him how to write the email. You can't do one without the other. Does that make sense? <laughs> there you go. Any other question? Yes, sir. It seems to me, as you stated, that two-thirds of those salespeople are lost forever, of the enterprise rep salespeople. They're fucked. <laughs> and I say it with all honesty because I don't want them to, right? Yet, if I see the vice presidents of sales over the past years that I've worked for, that are currently applying a job and telling me like, dude, can you get me in a startup? I'll take an individual contributor role right now. Get me in. I see the writing on the wall. And it is a hard writing on the wall. And it's, it, I'm not happy about it, and I'm certain that some will find their way. But overall, it's being very, very tough in the old, older generation. And I say this, it, it, you know, people say it can be about age. It essentially is. There's exception all along. Great about that, but it essentially is. If you ever see your kid, anybody you have a teenage kid, if you see them operate that Apple, multi-screen, go back and forth. Like, my screen right now is about eight tabs open, right? Go to any younger kid. They have 16 tabs open, you can't read anything. They're tabs open, multi-screen, multiple dimensions. You go like, what the crap, man? They use multiple tools, they use all these things. They are just, you know, just sign of the times, I don't know. I'm not saying that as an enterprise rep you can't make that. I'm just saying that what I see out there is very few doing it actually. And I, you know, I embrace the ones who do and I just, you know, like, I, I train as best as we can for the ones that, uh, that can't. Um, not on high velocity, they have, a, of course, there's a room somewhere. We primarily apply them to the enterprise sales because the enterprise sales, the larger deals, still have to learn all that. In the enterprise sales, essentially, it is the millennial salesperson that is completely non-relevant because they want to rush through this deal and then they are completely out of the picture, right? You can't do it in a larger uh, scale deal, multi-dimensional, multi multi-dimensional organizational selling. You, you can't use them over there. They have no clue what they're doing, right? But what you see is specialization of a sales force. We just created a new sales force for a new market. That's what is happening. Buyers buying online, high velocity. I'm gonna deploy my online sales team. Enterprise sales, slow velocity, bigger ticket price, I'm gonna deploy my enterprise sales. High velocity online web sales, I'm gonna deploy machine algorithms in order to do that. Last question. Yes, sir. Do you have any advice how you spice up your LinkedIn profile? Yes, but the question not to that is show up naked because that probably would be my Dutch answer, but I would not be really spicing it up. Yes. <laughs> First and foremost, I'm gonna show you what you're doing. You're gonna go like, I'm gonna use you, I'm gonna explain to you the bridge that helps you think about this. Think of the LinkedIn profile 
as a doctor, as you being a doctor, you're on your LinkedIn profile, or sorry, you are a patient, you have an issue. You have a liver issue, a knee, no, knee issue, make it easy. You have a knee issue. And you're looking up a doctor. What is the first thing you want to see from the doctor? Has he done it before? Hallelujah. Right? I want to see if this puppy had done it before because I'm not going to operate him. So if this particular salesperson is only like one month with the company and he says he's a specialist in it, I go like, Ditsky, not good, right? Okay, so first thing is I want to so, uh, know if he's done it before. What else do I want to see? Success rate. Success rate. You want to see, hey, show me some use cases. Show me some great successful things because I want to know if, if you know, like what it looks like. And so what we see essentially is we want, we are looking at a product, and I'll use my own just for, and so what we see down here is essentially looking at the following. You're going to laugh. Okay. First of all, if you teach this to your sales teams, this is a good fun thing to exercise and, and not. I do not want the girls with the sexy look. Any girl, sexy look, prom pictures, sexy dresses, cleavages, anything that looks sexy, gotta go. It just gotta go. Any guy that thinks he can give me this sly mugshot, like look as like cool as ever, gotta go. Any time that you wanna show the big fish you caught on vacation, gotta go. There's no room for it. There's just no room for it. This is how you show up professionally. This is how you show up in a meeting. Do you see yourself walking into a meeting with a fish you caught and go like, like, <laughs> like no, you won't. So you won't do that, right? So you see a girl walking in and high, six inch higher. Now you don't see the heels, but you see the beautiful dress on top, the gown from whatever. You won't, it's not acceptable. Okay, so what we see down here is we see a couple of things. First things first, you need to change your head title. After the picture, which is smiling eyes, by the way, I want to see a smile, I want to see your eyes reflected. This heat chart that shows down here, it's like all traffic goes here. You can, do, you can Google heat chart, LinkedIn profile, and it tells you. Second thing is that title. The reason why the title is so incredibly important, it's like the subject line of an email. That title needs to say what problem you're solving. Because primarily customers, when you visit their profile in an accelerated manner with one of the tools I showed you, they only see this. So they need to see sales architect, design, build, and skills sales teams. Well, at that point in time, I need to know what you're doing. If, I, if you're visiting my profile, and I see that headline, which is my only tag, and I visit you back, then I have to assume, on my end, that you're probably interested in something, because you saw the tagline. And if I then see, and I do a quick research, oh, this is a company that just received $50 million of funding, you betcha that I reply and say, hey, notice you have $50 million in funding. Are you having any scaling issues? Here's a blog post. On that note, here are three blog posts. These blog posts indicate exactly your knowledge. This is the third part of the story. First was the picture. Second was the headline. Third one is you got to share content. This here is your outbound emailing. Your outbound email, this is the content of the email. The tagline was the subject line. This is what is the content of the topic. The moment you visit any of these profiles, I see it on my end. I recognize the moment you share it, uh, reply to it, note it, anything you do on that post, I see that. Not as you view it, but everything else I do. Then the third thing is, I need to tell a story. Now on this one, I bring up Cecilia. Cecilia loves me because she knows, like, I got people who know me all across the world right now. This is, like, becoming odd. And why? Because Cecilia has a profile, and the profile is written in this, and this is written in the first. I love to dance. Dancing makes me happy, and I especially love Latin dances. In dancing, it requires both partners to know each other, to dance to the same rhythm and beat, and to anticipate the next move. A memorable performance requires both partners to be fully committed, in tune with each other, and that takes a positive mindset, a smile, and laughter along the way. And if you see Cecilia's picture, it matches that. She's a really nice person, okay? Do you know, you know, and Cecilia is not an outbound salesperson, she's a customer success manager. Do you know what the first thing is customers talk about when they talk to Cecilia? Dancing. What a great topic. 
It's a bridge point. We call it the bridge point of the conversation. They're talking about dancing. So when Cecilia gets a customer success person on the line and they say like, oh my God, I love your profile. You love tango dancing. It is a great conversation to have. Now, these are skill sets that need to be trained on how to properly build that, right? If you go at my freaking profile, I have an ego like yay high. So I felt the need to write like an entire story, right? This is not a good example if you're in sales, in case you're me, then that's quite okay. <laughs> Just because I have enough followers, I don't need people anymore. But if you're young and you're 150 follower, uh, users that you may uh, networking people, then you probably need not to do this. You're not gonna get there. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think it's great. I think that, you know, like failures are great stories. If you see pretty much downstairs, Everyone is a failure. Oh, by the way, when I share content, make sure you share faces. Faces are essentially when you're sharing content. Don't just share PDFs and PowerPoint. But yes, failures are all over the map. Pretty much what we did with Kentucky, we missed the Netflix window. And pretty much what we did with Sco we missed every window. You know, like if anything, I missed like six, seven different windows. It was failure all along. It's just, it's just part of life, I guess. Next question, and then I'll uh, close. Yes, sir, in the back. Uh, do you have advice for us uh, regarding the profiles uh, that are listing in your uh, listing profile? Because now you have nine, probably one of nine. Uh, do you respond to everybody? Say it again. Do you respond to anybody? No, if people visit your profile, do you respond to everybody? Hell no. I qualify right on the get-go. I only respond to the people that I like. If people send me an email, do I respond to everybody? Absolutely not. I do check. Um, do I respond if, if a kid writes me, hey, Jaco, just watched the video, really inspired, hope we can connect because I want to learn more about sales. Of course, I'm going to accept that. But if, you know, it's like knocking on the door. If somebody knocks on the door, you open it up and he stands there like, like dude, you know, like, no, like, please, right? Sometimes if you click on this, here's the tricks that I look at. How many connections do you have? How many do we have shared? Um, if you're in, whatever, I'm sorry to say this, but if you're in Bangalore or somewhere from there, I have nothing in common with you. I really don't need to get connected with you because all you're doing is the following. I'm gonna show you a trick. Alex, you're locked up. Eric, you're probably locked up. Mark, maybe you're not locked up. He's my, uh, uh, well, I'm calling my brother. But if Mark is not locked up, then he's gone, let's see. You come on. What I'm looking for is the following. Yeah, I have internet connection, yes, but it's not working. Okay, what I'm looking for is, you see this number here? Something happens that all of you need to aware of, and I've done this over the past days with some uh, big companies around here. If I send you a LinkedIn request and you accept, do you know what the message coming back to, you, to me is? What is the message when somebody accepts your LinkedIn request? What does the message say? Right? It says something like the following. Mark accepted your LinkedIn request. Congratulations, Mark accepted your LinkedIn request. Do you want to see his connections? Oh yeah, I love me some connections. <laughs> so I click on Mark and what do I see? I see three things. Shared, new, all. Great. Well, let me see, and I'm not even in the shared, the shared ones are right. Let me see all. I click on all, and Mark is essentially giving me all his connections. I'm calling up my contact, Pretty Haggett. Pretty has my login information on LinkedIn. I don't need to do this anymore, don't be afraid, I'm good. But technically speaking, Pretty cost me $7.50 an hour. Pretty will go into your LinkedIn profile and will harvest all your connections, but in 24 hours I will have them back your connections, she will have found matching email addresses, found as best as you can matching uh, uh, contact information. I'll have your database. Great. 
1,500 connection I just harvested. Great value. That one I do, I'll do this next month again. Now I see who your new connections are. Those ones, I'm gonna give, if, if you are by any chance my competitor, I'm gonna, or somebody that is relevant in the market that I'm selling to, I'm gonna give that to my SDR and say, those are your hot leads. $7.50 an hour is gonna cost me approximately 60 to $70 to harvest your email. Now, mind you, I can harvest your email 24 seven. Right now, what you see is you are leaving tracks everywhere on your profile, everywhere, you're leaving digital footprints. Those who can track it. Do you really think that successful sales teams are just good at selling? They are good at tracking, they are good at everything. They have constant connections. You are leaving marks everywhere. If I know where my competitor is going, then why in the world would I start hunting somewhere else if I can track down? That's the first place where I would start. So yes, I do not accept connections from everyone, but for sure, I lock up, every company needs to lock up the security. There are two or three basic security settings. Later on, we'll ask you to invite your uh, LinkedIn, uh, to pr provide your email, so we can send you some of that info if you choose so to want it to deploy inside your company. Okay, that's it. Round last, bomb, dead. Quick feedback, was this of value to you? Did you get out of this what you had hoped you would get out of this? Okay, great. With that, I'll hand it over back to Rulof. One more thing. Just one more thing. I have one request. My name is Rulof Hengst. I'm coordinating all winning by design efforts here in the Netherlands. We have in these hats at the back and also here in the front a little card. And if you are interested in the Prezi uh, Jakob was using, please enter your email address. And we, uh, we are also aiming at uh, getting Jaco back in April or May. And so we are checking, uh, so think with us, if there is demand for our boot camp about growth sales and customer success. So if you're interested in that, let, let us know. Just push the check mark and we'll get you informed. And if you're in need and help of help, please let us know as well and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. So give a backhand. Yeah. Thank you.